way back when we were learning our reading and writing, I'm not sure we all realized just how much of a difference a few vowels could make. But the topic I'm going to be talking on today shows you that a few vowels can make a really big difference. Uh, zoonosis or zoeia. One can make us sick and the other can increase our wellness in regards to sharing our lives with animals. Any of you that have taken my pet first aid class or you know, most of us who have gone through um, elementary, middle school, high school biology, we've learned about zoonotic diseases. Hey Gail, thanks for joining in and Scott too. Zoonosis or zoonotic diseases are diseases that can transfer between species. Things we can get from animals, but also that animals can get from other animals or animals can get from us. Many of you may not know that we can give birds our common cold. We don't share the same um, gut bacteria and we can actually make our birds sick. More often than not, we're always thinking about, you know, what animals can make us sick, but it can also work in the reverse too. Sorry, I just hit the computer there. I'm gonna send it sailing right out. But um, anyway, I wanna talk about zoonotic diseases, diseases that transfer from one species to another. Now, there are a lot of diseases animals have that we can't get. That's why very often when I'm talking about giving an animal mouth to snout resuscitation, it's really safer than giving it to a human because whatever a human has, we're going to get too. But you're not going to get distemper from a dog or parvovirus. You're not going to get feline rhinotracheitis from a cat. Those are species-specific diseases and they don't cross the species barrier. Probably the one you've all known about ever since you were a child, whether you grew up on Old Geller or Cujo, was rabies. And rabies can affect all animals and can cross the barrier. So my point here is there are some diseases I just want you to be aware of because they can um, you know, cross that barrier and it's important that we know the signs and symptoms so that we take care when we're working with animals or sharing our lives with them. Go to the blog I have um, you know, posted here on this so that you can read it in written form and really take it down. But I want you to realize that 61% of the pathogens that affect us humans are actually zoonotic, meaning they come from another animal, not just simply from a bacteria or a virus. And this is due to a lot of factors. Um, we have you know, taken over different parts of the world that were animal habitats before. We've increased our global travel, so we're traveling to places you know, that we aren't immune to diseases and being exposed to different things. And we're also creating greater intimacy with the animals in our lives, which is awesome because pets are part of the family. But what I just want to remind you about are there's some really simple things you can do, especially with the pets in your lives. When we're talking about wild animals, there are, you know, or some other precautions to take as well. But with our pets, really learn how to safely handle and restrain them so that you don't get bitten. Pay attention to body language. And you don't really have to take a class, but go online, look at some pictures, view some videos, get acquainted with what an upset cat looks like or an afraid dog. Because fear can often turn to anger or aggression when suddenly that animal is being cornered. So we need to know how to properly handle animals and read their ever-changing body language so that we don't get bitten. But bites or scratches certainly can lead to zoonotic diseases. And what a lot of us don't realize, it isn't as simple as just going into the bathroom and washing your hands with some warm um, water and soap. When you've been bitten by another species, it's really, really important that you get out the chlorhexidine, the antibacterial soap. If you're just buying it in your local drugstore, it might be under the name of Hibiclens, H-I-B-I-C-L-E-N-S, but chlorhexidine, it's generally pink. There's sometimes some bluish green versions as well, but you need to wash with that and you need, if it's a, a bite that broke the skin, you really need to wash with it for like 10 minutes. Not just singing happy birthday like they tell you, you know, to, for restaurant employees to make sure that your hands are really clean. But when something is penetrated, especially a tooth with saliva, it's really important we get that um, bacteria out. 5% of the people that are bitten by dogs get an infection. Obviously, sometimes it can be much worse than an infection depending on, you know, the bite and the, the tear to the, the skin and um, tissues beneath. But only about 5% of the time um, do people get infections. But with cats, 
that number is way above 50 percent. They just have more hypodermic like needle like teeth and um, they you know penetrate our skin but since it's a narrow puncture our skin actually starts to close up pretty quickly. You're actually better off when you get a bite and it bleeds um, although I know none of us like to see blood, but that actually helps clean the wound out. Whereas when it doesn't bleed, it often closes up quickly and that bacteria is trapped. We think no big deal. And before we know it, we have an abscess and we're on IV penicillin or we're, you know, getting all kinds of medications to get rid of the bacteria. So just keep that in mind. Good hygiene, but it's really much longer than you think. So rabies. Rabies can range from fevers to muscle aches to hallucinations to you, you've seen it in the movies. The animals are foaming at the mouth. Those are the later stages. And the unfortunate thing, what a lot of people don't realize with animals with rabies, that yes, they quarantine a dog for a bite. But the only way to this day that they've determined if an animal truly has rabies is they have to remove the head and send it to the local county health department to, um, to assess the brain tissue. So that means if a pet is really suspected of having rabies, he's gonna be euthanized. So we wanna do all we can to prevent that, and that's kind of a whole nother talk, but, but you know, that's the thing with animals and health and disease and safety. One thing kind of leads into another, but it's just important that, um, uh, you're aware of that, that you keep your pet's vaccinations up to date, or you do titer testing, which hopefully most of you know about, which is a simple blood test that can determine if a pet is immune to a disease. And actually, it's the only guarantee that a pet is immune to a disease. So you can vaccinate an animal every six months if you want, and some are just what are called non-responders, and they're not going to build up the antibodies to that disease. So titer testing or blood testing is really the best way to go. Cat scratch fever is actually more than just um, getting scratched by your cat. It can be a bite as well. And again, this is one of those things um, you need to learn how to properly handle pets. But, you know, doggone it, the best of us, people who have, you know, really work around animals, actually, they're the ones that are more likely to get bitten only because the chances are so vastly increased because they spend more time around animals and it's going to happen. I got badly bitten by a feral cat one time and boy, did I have quite the, the pus see volcano on my wrist, you know, days later and went through the IV penicillin and, you know, all was fine, but, you know, it does happen even when you're careful. So know the signs, do the washing, realize with a lot of things like cat scratch fever, some of the symptoms you may notice first are swollen lymph nodes. And on us humans, pretty similar to our pets, the lymph nodes are in the neck, in the armpits and the groin. They're the tissue, the lymphatic tissue that catches disease. So you'll see the swelling there. But you may, you know, notice other things such as, you know, fever and pain and, you know, just that redness as well. Toxoplasmosis. I personally haven't heard of just but a few people um, acquiring this. It's more likely to be gotten by um, people that have cats in their lives that live outdoors or go outdoors and come in because cats often get it from eating um, mice and birds. It is possible for a cat to get it from raw food, but generally our raw diets, hopefully all of us, you know, taking the appropriate precautions and that's not an issue. The thing is, it doesn't really show up too badly in cats most of the time, maybe just like a little bit of an illness. But in humans, we kind of get more flu-like symptoms from it. We'll get the vomiting, the diarrhea, the muscle aches, um, the swollen lymph nodes, as I was mentioning before. But the problem is for anybody that has a compromised immune system, it can be much more serious. And also, ladies, if you're pregnant. It can result, toxoplasmosis can result in blindness in the unborn child. So it's just important when you have animals in your life that you share that with your OBGYN. You too can get a titer test, a blood test, and you may find out that you actually carry the antibodies to toxoplasmosis and don't have to worry about it. It's a, a sigh of relief. Actually, more and more people seem to have it these days. So um, it's just an important thing to be in the know. What do they say? Knowledge is power. And the more we know what to be aware of, because sometimes we don't even know the questions to ask. So, you know, sharing that kind of information that you do have cats in your life when you're pregnant with your vet can be very helpful. 
If you don't have the antibodies, you need to assign somebody else in the household to litter duty for the ni next nine months. But don't give away your kitty cat. That cat will be a wonderful companion to that that baby who becomes a child. So I don't think an animal should ever lose its home because a human is coming into the world. Just be smart, be in the know, and take whatever precautions are needed. Giardia and coccidia. Those are intestinal parasites, and they can come from things as simple as us not really washing out our pet's water bowl. It's important you wash it every day like you do your plate and your coffee cup and everything else. Wash it with warm, soapy water and make sure you get rid of the soapy residue too because, of course, that could lead to diarrhea. If you go to a dog park, um, don't share the communal or don't let your dog share the communal water bowls. Bring a, a collapsible water bowl along with you or one of those water bowls, bottles that pour down on a tray or some way to give your pet fresh water. It's just too likely for him to pick up any kind of disease that way. When you're hiking and there's lakes and streams, I know they're going to be, you know, enticed to go in and take a few laps. But again, bring along that fresh water because if you don't, your pet may end up with massive quantities of vomiting and diarrhea that can then be shared with you. So that takes me again to hygiene, not just washing your hands, but if you're cleaning up after your pet, Make sure you slip on those rubber gloves. I know a lot of us don't take the time. We think we're going to just wash our hands real quickly and, you know, all will be well. Well, on any given day, I'm sure each of us has some paper cuts, some pin pricks, some kind of little openings. And any opening in the skin is bacteria's highway into our bloodstream. So it's really important that we do take the time when we're cleaning up vomit and diarrhea from any species to slip on those gloves because just those few seconds we didn't take may end up in us having the vomiting and diarrhea too. And I know, you know, medication can get us well and our pets too, but why go through this? You know, there are so many times we can't avoid it. So let's try to, you know, practice so that we can avoid the ones that are um, avoidable. Got ringworm? That's another thing to be aware of. If you see a missing patch of fur, and especially if it's kind of scabby and scaly um, on the skin, it's very likely the cat or dog in your care might have ringworm. Ringworm is not a worm. It's actually a fungus, but it gets that name from that round, ringular, ringular? <laughs> circular shape. And it's um, you know something we can get to if we touch it. So again, you're going to want to be careful about having gloves on when you're checking out a pet, being careful that if you hold the kitty up against you that you take that shirt off right away and wash it, keep their bedding clean. Um, ringworm can be treated. It's actually, I don't want to say it's a beautiful thing because it's not, but if you have a black light or what's called a wood lamp, it, it fluoresces. It's really interesting to see and it needs to be treated with antifungal um, medication. But again, watch out for those missing patches of hair on, on a dog or a cat. Lyme disease. Now, this is a different kind of zoonotic disease in that it's not something we're necessarily going to get from our dog or a cat. We're going to get it from ticks, and our pets in turn can get it from ticks. Lyme disease on a human, you'll notice, looks something like a target. It's a, it's a round red circle with another red circle around it. So if you see that on the skin, you're in significant trouble. Um, I actually have a friend who had Lyme disease and it's kind of an ongoing issue with her. I think she's pretty much on her way to recovery, but it's, it's a long-term um, illness. You have to be hospitalized. So just, you know, check your pets for ticks, have them on preventive and check yourself after you take hikes too. There's a great Pratt, bad Brad, I can't even spit it out now. Brad Paisley song about checking for ticks, but that's a whole nother issue. So um, Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is also something us and our pets can get from ticks. And the difference between that and Lyme disease, as far as recognizing it, is the Lyme disease is that target, like I told you, a, a round red circle with another circle around it, where Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, kind of like its name, it's gonna appear more like a rash. One that we can't get from ticks is called cytozoonosis, C-Y-T-A-U-X zoonosis. But I want to bring that to your attention because I don't think too many people are talking about it. And it really is more for outdoor cats or ones in rural areas, but it is um, a disease cats can get from ticks. It's often nicknamed bobcat fever. 
And cats can go down really, really quick from cytozoonosis because what actually happens is the infection prevents the blood from getting to the tissues and, and it results in multiple organ failure just in a matter of days from the bite. So don't think when you have indoor kitty cats that they're not gonna get fleas or ticks. I've had so many friends over the years say, well, my cat's scratching the heck out of herself, but she can have fleas, she never goes outside. She can, they can jump the threshold, they can come in on your clothing, they could come in on another pet. My um, best trick with fleas always is if you don't believe your pet has them go to the base of their tail you know right at the top where the tail connects to the the torso and get out your little flea comb with the tight teeth just comb out some of that flea dirt and put it on a damp white paper towel if the dirt just sits there yep the pet's dirty that's his dander he's been rolling in the dirt whatever but if that paper towel starts to turn even the slightest bit pink that's dehydrated blood from your pet um, I, I shouldn't say not dehydrated, uh, digested blood from your pet that the flea is left behind. So even if you're not seeing the flea, they're there somewhere and your pet needs treatment. Leptospirosis. When I was living in California, it wasn't something we thought about much. But now that I'm in the southeast in wetter climates, leptospirosis is something of a concern. Um, in the, the West, most of the time when your dogs get their core vaccinations, the um, it's usually a four in one, DHPP, distemper hepatitis, parvovirus, and parainfluenza. In the southeast, maybe in the northeast, other locations, wherever it's wet, it'll be a five in one shot, distemper hepatitis, leptospirosis, parvovirus, and parainfluenza. Leptospirosis can affect the kidneys and it can be obtained near wetter areas if pets are eating feces of um, infected animals, um, just near lakes and streams. So it's important because if our pets get it, we can get it too. And then that also leads me to heartworm. Um, we get that from the mosquito. And it's just such an important thing that I want everybody to be aware of, even if you're out in the hot, dry west, and not to rub it in the... Um, face of my former Los Angeles, well, not my former friends, but my, my former neighborhoods in Los Angeles. Here in Hotland and GA, I think we might get up to 85, 87 degrees today. Sorry that you're gonna be in triple digits again. All right, I know I'm making enemies rather than friends, but um, heartworm is in your area too. That, that's the point I was getting to because we have transported pets beginning with Katrina across country because we travel with our pets more because we just, you know, things are changing and heartworm, if you see a mosquito, your pet absolutely should be on preventive. Preventive is cheaper and easier by far than the treatment. When uh, a dog has to go through the imidacide injections for six months, basically, they have to lay still as the body is shedding those worms so that they don't get caught up in the heart, the lungs, the intestines. Um, it's a tough treatment. It's an expensive treatment. So you just want to make sure your pets are on that preventive. Um, in many cases, it's just as simple as a monthly chew that most animals like the taste of and it just prevents them because we never know um, for sure if they're when they get bitten by a mosquito. Psittacosis is also called parrot fever. So those of you with avians in your life with the beautiful feathered birds, just you know, take care, especially if you're noticing any green droppings or a nasal discharge. Um, make sure you're wearing a mask when you clean out their cages. With psittacosis, it's um, kind of like um, for, for humans, you end up with coughing, vomiting, kind of a pneumonia-like um, symptoms. So again, Caution is, is the, way, the order of the day. And then lastly, as far as zoonotic diseases, I wanna mention is salmonella. And in all honesty, you're probably more likely to get salmonella from undercooked chicken. But if you have reptiles or amphibians in your lot, lot, life, um, wash those hands. Once again, really wash them thoroughly after you've been you know, touching your, your scaled friends um, before you, you know, eat that, that sub sandwich for lunch. It's just an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, salmonella is, uh, I think it's a protozoa, isn't it? I didn't, I didn't write it down for me today, but um, it results in abdominal cramping and, you know, really discomfort in us humans. And it can lead to death, actually, like many of these diseases. So prevention is worth a, a pound, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure to be old and cliche here. 
But those are zoonotic diseases, things that can transfer between species. And I know you've heard me talk about this before, but I want to end today just reminding you of zoea, that more recently coined word that is the inverse, the opposite, so to speak, of zoonosis. It's the wellness our pets bring into our lives. We know they lower blood pressure and they help people heal and they just heal our hearts in so many ways. But they get us up off the sofa and make us exercise because we have to walk the dog. They often cause many people to, it might be the final straw that gets people to kick the habit and stop smoking because we have found out that secondhand smoke is equally bad for pets in our lives. People that are shut-ins or the elderly actually get out because they need to get the pet outside. Um, it just makes them more social. Children that actually bond with pets, it's, we're finding scientific proof, we're finding the data that they grow up to be more sympathetic and empathetic human beings because they've learned to connect with another species, something you know other than themselves. And very often, um, children that live with animals have stronger immune systems than those that don't. A lot of times these people nowadays that are allergic to um, cats are ones that never grew up with them. So it really you know, enhances and improves our wellness, our physical wellness, our mental, emotional, and spiritual ones. And we're finding wonderful things about kids reading to dogs because dogs don't judge. You know, they let kids practice and say the word wrong and make kids actually talk out loud and improve their reading skills. And we're finding out that some of the kids that are actually going to shelters and reading to dogs, it's really helping socialize and keeping up the spirits of the dogs and making them more adoptable. So having animals in your life is absolutely a win-win in my opinion. Um, but, you know, there are some things we need to be careful of that we don't you know, cause pain or suffering or illness to our pets and that we don't in return get that from them. So I can't thank you guys that tune in enough. I've just been trying to give you, you know, a little bit of content a couple of times a week, hoping to increase your knowledge, but obviously not telling you everything, getting those wheels spinning and hoping you'll research and learn more and tune into your pets for the sake of the wonderful best friends in your life. Have an awesome, awesome day, and I'll see you next time. And remember, zoonosis versus zoea, there's just a few vowels difference, but it can make a huge bit of difference in the health of us. Bye-bye for now.